about Bell is you, if you look at their history in the airborne public safety space, you have to go back more than 70 years. And, you know, Bell not only developed and fielded the world's first police helicopter and the world's first fire helicopter, we're still partnered with those same agencies today. For these smaller units, and I guess that would be the question I would pose to the panel is, how do we, in these structures where we have non-aviator lieutenants and, and sergeants and whatnot, how do we help them as like, because everybody here is an aviator and can speak to that. How do we help those people that are put in those positions to, to lead these aviation units with no aviation experience? And Clay, we'll start with you. Well, I'm not probably the guy to talk about that, you know, cause I'm not in that environment, but, um, I think that that leader placed in that position is is really put at a disadvantage, um, and it's not his or her fault. Um, so you know, there's resources out there, the the apps and stuff to get them familiar with the aviation world. Um, but but again, uh, I don't know how you take someone and put them into something that's so specialized. You know, you want to take somebody and put them over a gang unit put them over a neighborhood police officer unit, put them over motors, that all gels with being a blue suit cop, right? That all, that, that man, I understand that. I'm going to be on a radio. I'm going to be going to calls. I'm going to be doing these things. I'm patting people down. This, this aviation stuff, a lot like canine, it, it, it's a different deal. It, 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 it is. And I don't know how you take that brand new promoted three or four year sergeant and put him in aviation and expect him to be successful. I, I really don't. Terry, let's jump to you. It, it, it's a great question, and there's no easy answer. So it'll, for me, it's a, it's a partial answer, um, and I'll, I'll stay with this theme of uh, favorite quote. You can't have great followership without great leadership, but the converse is true. You can't have great leadership without great followership. So th there's a job we have to do as followers when we're working for that leader. We have to do our part, even though he's maybe not in the right. We owe it to them to give them that chance and to – to manage him up, make him look good in that regard to a point. Uh, and I'm not saying if you do that, you, you have fixed the problem, but you've done your part, right? And, and you can sleep well at night to that part. In aviation, that challenge gets tougher because now we have potentially a, a dangerous situation. And that's where we have to draw the line. Um, and, 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 you know, if safety is first, make it first. Um, and sometimes that's making very hard decisions and very hard stances. Um, and as professionals, we, whether we're leaders or followers, at times we have to make those calls. It, it's an unfortunate situation. And if you ask me, it's probably one of the number one challenges that face police aviation is how we, how we develop or lack of develop and place those managers in those positions. One last comment to it, John. Um, it, it's not an absolute that that's what's going to happen. Some people, as I believe Clay said, they do have those natural traits and they, they do have that ego in check and you can get a guy in there with no aviation experience that will excel in that aviation leadership role. If you have to look at what he's doing well, though, he's put his ego in check. He's tapping into those SMEs and he's making it work for him and for the unit. Great, great stuff. Um, Really good stuff. Uh, the ego part of it is so huge. <laughs> With, even though our sergeants and lieutenants ended up learning to fly, uh, they, they were never going to be at the level of the people that they're supervising. Never. It, it's impossible. You know, there's pilots that were flying 5,000 5, hours a year, uh, and the supervisor flew occasionally, and, and it came down to personality. It really did. The, the supervisors, whether it was a sergeant, lieutenant, or a captain, it didn't matter. If they came in with an open mind and they came in humble and they came in wanting to be a sponge, I mean a true sponge, and absorb everything from safety to maintenance to tactics to, to missions to, you know, wh whatever it was, the tactical flight officer program, if they came in with an open mind and went to the subject, subject matter experts – and learned, they succeeded. We had fantastic supervision that, that came in with that 
parking that ego at the door. As a matter of fact, there used to be a sign outside our roll call room. It was there for when I first got there. It said, park your ego at the door. And that that's so valuable in this in this position because I agree with, with you guys saying we're, we're kind of throwing people in to a very unique position. They're used to telling cops what to do. Clay, Clay nailed that, you know. But this isn't that. You, there's now – the FARs are more important than the police officer manual. And some could never absorb that. I'll just give yeah. you a, a quick example of a, of a captain and that, that just didn't understand what we did and why we did it and how we did it and wanted to change the world without knowing anything. And him sitting in on a briefing one day uh, about uh, shooting for the helicopter and safety officer, chief pilot, Lead, uh, lead pilot of that unit happened to be me and a few others. We were all chiming in on whether to go to training that day with SWAT. And there was something going on with – it had to do with a fire and some weather stuff. And we went around the room, and it was unanimous. We're not going. We're not going today. The risk is too great. We can't mitigate it. There's things out of our control. It's just training. We do it twice a month. See you in two weeks. Unanimous. And – the, the captain was just listening in, and he said, well, if this was a real incident, you guys be going right now. You understand that. And he walks out the door. And we, we've pretty, we're all sitting there like, did he just say that? <laughs> Stunned. <laughs> and then laughing and knowing that our sergeant is going to have to go explain to him that, guess what? The pilot in command makes that decision. The safety officer can make that decision. The chief could tell you to go, and if the pilot in command says, I'm unable to go because of the FARs, because of visibility, or because of weight and balance, or because of whatever the reason, it doesn't matter what it is, the million things that we all had to deal with, that you're not going. It, it, it's different from the normal police work where the captain goes, charge, <laughs> and, you, and you go, charge. It's different in aviation, and the ones that accepted that from day one succeeded. The ones that didn't accept that and said, no, 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 I'm used to sending uh, these one-year coppers telling them what to do, and that's what I'm going to do with all you, you know, 15-year coppers that have more experience in this aviation field than I've ever had. You know, they just, they did not succeed, and they struggled, and some left uh, by choice and some left by pressure, Uh, and at times, it actually affected safety. Uh, That last this particular captain I'm thinking of, I actually wrote an article for for um, Vertical about, and I just took every bad thing up about how he managed and put it into that article because it covered all of them, all the ones that I've talked to people around the world about, as many of you have. I mean, Brian talking about how many how many of his emails had to do with that. Even that number stunned me, Brian. <laughs> But, I, I, but in the big scheme of things, I'm going, you know, I shouldn't be surprised at that, you know, because yeah. I heard it so many times. And it comes down to, like, once again, just to finish, ego and personality. You come in humble and you want to learn, you'll succeed. You will um, in any specialized unit. But if you come in thinking you're going to change the world and you don't even know what an FAR, sta- what the FAR stands for, uh, that's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem. Yeah. You know, just to tag on that, Jack, is the Army, I think, does a really good job of developing leaders. And the reason why they do that is because, like, an, a division general doesn't necessarily know about every unit and every mission under his division. What he does is he surrounds himself with his subject matter experts. Yes. And I think what, and I think one of the problems in law enforcement and what may be the issue that we're, I think, truly dealing with is – when you're a street cop and you walk into a, let's just say a domestic violence, you already know the answer. You already know somebody's going to jail. You already know, you know, you know, you have all these things. You walk into that room and you take control, right? That's what we're taught in the police academy is that you have to take control of that scene, take control, uh, take command of the whatever's going on. I think it's a hard transition when you now are a police officer that promotes into, uh, say, a sergeant's rank. And now you're put in charge of brand new cops working in patrol because where do all the brand new supervisors go right to graveyard shift, right? Where all the brand new cops are. And then you're now 
a brand new supervisor training brand new cops and you tend to get into that micromanagement style of leadership because you're not really sure what you're supposed to be doing yet. You haven't really figured out, you know, a, as a brand new supervisor, what your job is. So what do you do? You go out and you ma micromanage your officers. Well, that's going to be, I think, even further when you end up in that aviation unit without any, any aviation experience. And now you don't know what to do to lead these guys who don't really need to be told how to go out and do their job because they know how to do their job. What they need is that support. They need the, the, like Terry said, removing the barriers, uh, you know, find out what they need, what they want and what makes them angry and then try to, to eliminate, you know, what they can and provide the, the things that they need. Um, and I think that's where, uh, you know, military leadership tends to do it a little bit better because they understand that like, Hey, I don't need to know everything about everything. I just need to bring the people in and lean on those experts. But I think what we have is we have an ego problem. Like we've already talked about where, Oh, I'm in charge. I, I, I need to know everything about this and I'm going to go out and I'm going to learn it. I, I, I do agree with, you know, yes, they need to go out. They need to read up. They need to get educated if they're going to be coming into an aviation unit and not understanding it. And I appreciate that. But at the same time, they can't just be like, well, I'm the leader. I'm making all the decisions and not lean on their experts, uh, subject matter experts, which are going to be those guys, like you said, that are the 15 year air unit yeah. pilots or TFOs yeah. that understand that and understand that mission more than they will ever understand it. And I think that's where I think that's the Achilles heel, really, of airborne law enforcement. And Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, in the military, you had varying ranks in the cockpit together, correct? Yep. I mean, oh, yeah. and in, in the cockpit, in the cockpit, rank doesn't matter, does it? Uh, correct. Or it, it shouldn't. And we right. had that situation with sergeants and lieutenants flying, and 99% of them accepted that. The 1% that didn't accept that, no, 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 I'm the sergeant or I'm the lieutenant, that, that created some incredibly dangerous issues and uh, some really conflicts. So, you know, yep. we, we have a lot to look. There's a lot we can learn from the military thinking, I believe. And, and you, you're lucky that you had that in you that you can really analyze it. Well, trust me, the military doesn't do everything right. I'll tell you that oh, no. right now. You of know, course not. not of that, course not. And none of us do, right? But I think that taking experiences or learning, you know, looking at how the airlines do things, looking at how the military does things, because that's what the military did back in, uh, you know, the early 90s was develop the crew resource management and started and leaned on the airlines to bring that training to the military to incorporate it into what we were doing to in, improve and increase, you know, safety. Um, right. And... So I think that, you know, taking bits and pieces, just like we talked, like I said earlier about like from your FTOs, you know, the ones that you like pick and use some of those uh, styles that they have and, and have demonstrated, use those. And uh, I think that's where, um, you know, if you go into a vacuum thinking that you know everything and you are not open to it, uh, you know, our, de our department would definitely put a SWAT sergeant in charge of the aviation unit without blinking an eye. But if you were to say, well, why don't you take an aviation sergeant or, you know, one of the aviation guys or a patrol sergeant and, and put him in charge of the SWAT team, they'd laugh you out of the they'd laugh you right out of the office. Like, that's they ridiculous. Would. What are you talking about? Like, so I think that putting an emphasis on, you know, one specialized unit over another is not a good that's not it's just it doesn't look good. But also uh, it's silly uh, in the fact that when you're talking about aviation. But again, it's that lack of knowledge of what it takes to go out and fly an aircraft and melding of these two careers together of, you know, the FARs and the FAA and, and, and everything that we need to know as police officers. So, uh, I think it's just short sighted that they think that, you know, we do like we're bus drivers. We just go out and, you know, operate a, yeah. a piece of equipment, like a motorcycle because it's a police motorcycle and that's not the case at all. Agreed a hundred percent. Brian, I'd like to, to shift to you now. Yeah. And, and just, uh, you know, there, there's a, there's a few phrases. You could walk into any air support unit in the world and say, and always get the same response. And one of those phrases is, I'm going to run aviation like we run patrol. And you will get the same look on everyone's face like someone just farted in the room. Because <laughs> in the history of law enforcement, that has worked exactly zero time. And it means things are about to get really awful. And, and, you know, even go beyond what you're saying, Jeff, 
if you go to patrol and say, how about we take just a civilian manager and put him in charge of the patrol shift, someone who's never been a cop before, and you get that same response, they'd laugh you out of the room. And that's what we're doing by taking a patrol supervisor and put him in charge of aviation. But back to your, your question about, you know, a, a small unit, it is challenging because you don't have a huge cadre of, of people to choose from because you're looking for three things. You have to have the institutional knowledge of, of aviation, which takes a long time, you know, to, to really get a grasp of. And then you have to look for leadership skills, but also in most of these small units, you have manager skills too because they don't give you support staff to handle all the purchasing and budgeting and scheduling and personnel management and all the other crap that leaves you sitting behind a computer all day when you're also supposed to be being a pilot and a leader. And, and it's up to the agency to identify what they have available and then what they're lacking and provide that training. If you have someone, just because you're a great pilot doesn't mean you're going to be a great leader or a great yeah. unit commander. And it may be because you just haven't had the training and that's something we can fix with proper training. Or it may be, be it's just not your thing. You may have someone who's a great le leader and, and manager and we have the resources and ability. And as Jack said, that person has the right attitude to then learn the institutional knowledge that they need to do that job well. I worked for Ed Van Winkle when I first started flying. And Ed at the time was not a pilot. He didn't, you know, he didn't have a pilot's license, um, but he was a very high ranking officer with the police department. And Ed always had a great attitude and he would come out and ask. And I was not ready to be a leader because I was young and young in the industry. We, we had Richard Bray, and we had our mechanic, Barney, who had been there for a thousand years. And Ed always had the right attitude to ask the questions and trust what they said. And eventually he, he listened enough where he got bit by the fatal bug of aviation. And, and now he's a very competent <laughs> pilot. Now look at him. But at the, time, yeah, look yeah, at the time, he didn't have that. He just had the right attitude and the right leadership skills and, and great manager skills. You know, phenomenal on those parts. But as Jack said, if you don't have the right attitude, then you come in, hey, I'm going to make my chops. I'm going to, I'm going to flex on the aviation unit. Let everybody show that I have, I have what it takes to push them around and make them do what I say. We're going to do it like patrol. And and you know, back on the APSA thing, we did the safety um, uh, survey every year, and this is the safety survey. And consistently, in the top four or five was management. Management was one of the top four or five safety concerns for the aviation units in our industry. And those phone calls I get and those emails I get, most of them would start with, hey, I got a new lieutenant who, oh, uh, we got this new major who called up today. Oh, uh, I got this new supervisor who said this. And then they would, they would just tell you the most ridiculous things. I, it was surreal sometimes. Um, but it was always kind of the same thing. We have... We have this new supervisor who came in and now they want to do this, or they said, we can't do this anymore. You know, if, if you turn down a mission, you have to write a memo to, to so-and-so. If you, you know, we're not going to follow the POH limitations for the aircraft anymore because we just got to get it done. You know, just, just crazy stuff. You know, this guy doesn't have a pilot's license, but you know, he knows the sheriff pretty well. So he's a new pilot. It's, it was just unbelievable. And it was, you still had the, hey, can you help us with inadvertent IMC? Can you help us with uh, this, this maintenance or loss of control training problem? But for every one of those was 10, hey, we just got this new supervisor and you won't believe what, what they're doing. I think before, you know, obviously, well, when I was working at RPD, I was in that vacuum of like, I just thought our department was just this one-off, you know, kind of, uh, I, I, didn't see it as being a huge problem in law enforcement. And it wasn't until I left and started looking back and then John and I started doing the podcast and we'd bring guests on and talking offline, we'd find out that this is a huge problem like that's throughout our industry. Well, then I obviously I listen to more than just the Hangar Z podcast. Uh, I actually don't listen to this at all because I don't like the sound of my own voice. But uh, <laughs> I 
started listening to other podcasts and I found a, a leadership law enforcement leadership podcast. And I'm sure some of you on the panel may have heard of uh, Dr. Jack enter, but uh, he's written a book and I got to pull it up because I always butcher the name or don't want to butcher the name of it, but challenging the law enforcement organization, proactive leadership strategies. And he just updated it. It's a, there's a new edition that's out. Um, but he has, there's, there's like a, I think a six or seven episode, uh, series on, uh, like Spotify of him talking about the issues. And it was like, and he even says in his, uh, in his, one of the episodes where he's given this presentation to like a, you know, like a big audience of law enforcement officers. And, uh, this guy from like Nairobi comes up and he's like telling him like, uh, you know, you've been spying on our department because you just changed the names, but the people you're talking about, those are the people, those are my department. <laughs> and he was very offended and he was like, no, 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 no. This like, and, but it's, it's because like, I mean, listening to everyone on this panel talk, like we've all had these same experiences yes. with the same. So we're not just like Brian's always said, like we have never found a new way to crash a helicopter. We just keep doing the same things over and over again. And it's absolutely true. And I think we're doing the same thing in, in the leadership realm. And hopefully that, you know, something like this is going to be what's going to, um, you know, that having this medium now to be able to share these stories and let guys, A, know that they're not in this alone, that this is a problem throughout our industry, but hopefully spark the young leaders that may be listening and hopefully that guys are sharing this with to maybe hear it from this panel of experts that this is, this is a real problem, yeah, not just in airborne law enforcement, but I think in law enforcement as a whole. I was Sorry, just gonna, we'll, I was going to say we'll to in my my life after law enforcement I visited agencies from California to Washington to Texas to Florida to New York to New Hampshire and the challenges are way more prevalent and and similar than the than the success stories meaning it doesn't matter what agency you go to in what state, like, like you were, like, like Jeff was saying, somebody's going to think you're talking about your agency from across yeah. the country because the challenges are the exact same. Um, the agencies who, who kind of have a, have, have a really strong handle on the culture, the administration, the operational aspects. Uh, unfortunately they're the anomalies, you know, yep. your, your, your LAPDs, your, your Texas DPSs. It's, it's unfortunate, but they're the anomalies and, but that's just, that's just the nature of it. It's, and it's difficult because, you know, we talk about people coming in that don't have previous aviation experience. And as Jack alluded to, if they have the right mentality, they can absolutely learn. And I, I dealt with several uh, supervisors at Riverside and several of them were really good guys, but even the really good guys had no idea what was going on until about their second year in command. Right. Because the reality is in aviation, it takes about two years before you really figure out which way is up. I mean, you, you think you have these, you have these moments of clarity, but the reality is anybody who's being really honest will tell you that, man, I didn't really figure anything out until I've been in here a couple of years. Yeah. You know, you know how many times you were flying around as a TFO and you're looking <laughs> for a guy in a red t-shirt and black shorts and your pilot is looking across the cockpit while he's dodging news helicopters and everything else. And he's like, Hey, is that the guy standing in the front yard right there? <laughs> and you're like, right. Where, where are you looking? And he reaches across your nose, that guy right there. Oh yeah. That might yeah. be him. And of course it is. And you're sitting there going, well, how is this yep. guy doing this? He's not even supposed to be doing what I'm doing. He's doing nine other things and he just found the yep. suspect and that's all I'm trying to do. But yep. you learn that it's a skill set. It's, it's, uh, it's situational awareness. It's multitasking. It's all of these things rolled into one and it just doesn't come to anybody easily. It comes to some more easily than it does to others. But I think anybody who's successful at it and who's good at it has worked really hard to get to that place. Um, and so uh, it's, it's difficult because to, to just grab somebody, um, 
And, uh, you know, it was, it was way more common in canines where you would get a guy out of patrol that had no canine experience. But the, the idea, our philosophy was always, we had a saying for, for new canine handlers, and it was good dogs to handle. And, and the philosophy was when the dog does something wrong, it's not the dog's fault, it's your fault. And that's, that was just, that was across the board. Uh, and you realize that it took you about a year just to learn your dog and really get in tune. And it would take you almost another year to really kind of figure out all the other stuff. And air support was the exact same way, which is why I know Jack is, will verify this. So many canine handlers tend to assimilate into the aviation side with a little bit, a little bit easier because they're used to kind of, they're used to kind of the whole scene. They're used to having to absorb and digest a lot of information very quickly and then come up with a plan. And it's, you're kind of doing the same thing in a helicopter. You're just doing it from the air as opposed to on the ground with a dog. And so the guys that we would see come out of the canine unit, they always just seem to have a little bit of a, a leg up. But, you know, it's it's a challenge regardless of, of where you are. And another point that, that Brian made that was a, a great point and I think hasn't been addressed was management. So in running a, an aviation unit, there's management responsibilities and there's administrative responsibilities. And they're two very, very different things. And I was fortunate in that I had... Um, a guy named Steve Valvo, who was my chief pilot, and he was my manager. And I was smart enough to know that he was a way better manager than I was. And so he was, I left him to basically run the day to day to, to, to manage the pilots and the TFOs and the, and maintenance and the training. And then I would say, what do you guys need? What do you need to do what you need to do? And I'll go get it because I've gotten very good at learning how to ask for things. I wasn't always good at it, but I learned after being said no to enough that there's a definite methodology of how you ask for things and when you ask for things. And so I decided that, that, you know, and I, and Steve and I had this conversation after I retired and I told him, I said, you were always a way better manager than I was. And I was at least smart enough to, to recognize that and know that that was your kind of, that was your, lane. And, and so there's, it's, it's, it's hard because I, it's, I think there's a lot of different facets. And I think a lot of the other thing is uh, a huge factor is I think you have to share a certain amount of the framework that you're dealing with, with the people in your units, because there's all kinds of pressures, influences, guidelines that come down from upper administration. And I think a lot of times these administrators in these units, they don't want to, they don't want to be honest with people and say, listen, I've just been told that if we don't cut our budget by 15%, we might not have an air unit. And instead of figuring out a way to say that, that doesn't cause everybody to want to go, you know, jump off a cliff, you have to be honest with people and you have to share it with them. Hey, listen, we've got some budget concerns guys. So we're going to have to learn how to maybe do some of the stuff we do a little bit more efficiently, a little bit more economically, fis fiscally responsibly. And I think if you share the framework that you're trying to work within with the people that you're working with and, and for, uh, it goes both ways. There's, you develop, you continue to develop the trust that you, hopefully you've already, you've already established. Um, because I, I think you, if you just stand there and say, you know, a lot of, a lot of supervisors supervise out of fear more than the desire to actually be successful. And it's, and, and, you know, we talk about why units don't have things and people, there's a lot of people that are just afraid to go ask for things, you know, because they're, they're, they're certain they're going to be told no. And, and, you know, or they've been, they've seen other people ask for things and they've been told no. So there's, it's a, I don't, I don't even know if there's a really good answer for it, but it's, it's a really multifaceted problem. And, you know, I, there's, I think all you can do is, is try to network as much as you can. You know, you talk about safety and I don't know if anybody else 
did this, but uh, we, my thing was we would take our risk managers on fly alongs all the time. We were on a first name basis with the risk management department in our city. And if you want to talk about people that hold the purse strings and have the ability to get you things or get things approved immediately, it's a risk management department. And so by doing that, you know, I would call and say, Hey, my guys have a concern about this, or they say their helmets are wearing out. Um, but we're told that our budget doesn't allow for us to buy new helmets. And you'd be surprised how fast a risk manager will get new helmets for the entire unit approved by just saying, Hey, listen, buy these guys new helmets, because if they crash and their, he their heads aren't protected, it's going to cost us so much more money than these stupid helmets are going to cost us. And so by, by networking and partnering with these different, um, authoritative voices within your, your, you know, your structure, you can, you can have the, the ability to lobby for things that maybe otherwise would fall on deaf ears. If it was just you saying, my guys need new helmets. Yeah, I, th I think most times. You know, people feel confined by the police department. They can only operate within the organizational guidelines that are set within that police department. And you thought outside the, the box there and established relationships in places that could get things done where that couldn't have been done within the police department, at least not as efficiently, you know? So I give right. you a lot of a credit in doing that. And, and um, it is true. It's, it's institutional, right? I mean, you're brought up in these departments and, you know, you, it didn't start with you. It started way before you were there. And there's all kinds of people that will that have preconceived ideas and, and knowledge about how things should be done or how things were done or, and all of that stuff. And so it's not that you, you don't acknowledge those things or you don't uh, respect those things, but I think you also have to say, Hey, listen, what is my vision and what do I think, where, I, where do I want this to go? And as long as that in the end, leads to a productive, safe, uh, and efficient operation that reflects positive to the, positively on the city and, and everybody else that's involved, then you just, you put, put the throttle down, you move forward, you just keep going.